Amen. Amen. So last week I started off sharing about our 17 and a half hour drive from Siesta Key, Florida, all the way to Nashville, Tennessee. And um, so I, if, if you were with us last week, you know that we got about 45 minutes into the, into the drive and we ran into like a torrential downpour. And y'all know it's been kind of like a drought here in Omaha for a while. I know this last week we've gotten a lot of rain. As a matter of fact, I think it's so interesting, interesting that the title this morning is Drenched to Drip. And I got, on my, got out of my car at Family Fair this morning and I took 10 steps and it's, I just started getting rained on, poured on. Y'all would have laughed if you saw me run here to the building this morning. I came in drenched, but I was dripping. So we hit this torrential downpour and we're um, coming back from Siesta Key and we're hungry. We got to stop. So we're, we're trying to find the closest Panera Bread quick, quick stop. We get to Panera Bread. It's one of these moments where it's raining so hard that I'm contemplating do I need to eat or just stay in the car and keep going? Like, I don't know what to do. But me and Cap, we don't like to skip meals. Am I right? We don't skip meals. Right, Joy? This man can eat. And so, and so he's like, tell her, tell her. Feed the man. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so I, I love my food. So I'm like, I can't give up a meal. But I don't. it is raining so hard. And my son Judah wants to come with me. And so I'm like, Okay, Judah, I'm scheming up a plan, and I'm like, all right, buddy, when I open this door, you need to get out quick so I don't get just rained on. You, hear, you with me? Are we, are we on the same page here? So what do I do? Jericho, you can testify to this. I open the door, and the guy is moving so slow. <laughs> I mean, I lost my mind for half a second, and all I heard my wife say was, Michael? I'm like, we talked about the plan as I'm just getting pelted with rain. So I run into this Panera Bread, and I mean, I am soaked. My shirt is uncomfortably wet. Who likes wearing wet clothes? Not me. Is anybody with me? It's the worst feeling. And, and so, like, we're just soaked head to toe. The cash register is kind of laughing at us because we're so soaked. And then we had to, like, scheme a plan to get out of here. And you're like, where's the hook of this story? I don't have one. I'm just telling you that I went to Panera Bread and got soaked. And here's the reality. Here's, here's, here's the reality. I was so soaked that when I got back into the car, my seat got so wet. I started thinking, like, this whole idea of drenched to drip. How many of you know that God wants to fill us with his spirit, to overwhelm us with his spirit, to give us power by his spirit so that we can what? Just be sponges? No, so that, so that we can drip, so that we can reach, so that we can have power for the mission that he's called you and I to. Now, I love the book of Isaiah because as we look at this book, and I'm just telling you, this is a very complex book. There's some days I'm reading it, I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, you got to get a Bible commentary, I'm just telling you. But I'll give you a little bit of context here. Chapters 1 through 39, the prophet Isaiah is bringing judgment against God's chosen people, the Israelites. Now, we see a shift happen that we talked about last week. In 39, Isaiah starts prophesying to their future of a future time when they'd be exiled in Babylon. You guys tracking with me? Those of us now, we've got the full Bible. We know that they spent 70 years in Babylon. It's kind of interesting that Isaiah prophesied this. And so we see here in chapters 40 through 66, there are moments where Isaiah is bringing some rebuke and some judgment, but a majority of it is a lot of encouragement. And there are these moments throughout these sections of Scripture where he is prophesying of Jesus coming to earth. Do you, do you sense the hope in your soul when you're reading the Old Testament and you're like, he is describing my king? Isn't it so cool that we see Jesus in the Old Testament? And in this little section in Isaiah chapter 44, we see a picture of God pouring out his spirit. Do you want to see it? He's prophesying to our future as New Testament believers. Let's check it out. It says this. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. But now listen to me, Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. 
The Lord who made you and helps you says, do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, O dear Israel, my chosen one. Here it is. For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. I just want to tell you, if you came in here thirsty today, if you came in here feeling dry, if you came in here feeling parched, you're about to leave drenched. You're about to leave filled up. You're about to leave restored. Do you believe it today? The Bible says, and I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. Some will proudly claim, I belong to the Lord. Others will say, and here's a great picture for us Gentiles, I am a descendant of Jacob. Some will write the Lord's name on their hands and will take the name of Israel as their own. Come on, is anybody thankful that God extended the blessing and the promise of his spirit to the Gentiles? If you're not a Messianic Jew in here, you are a Gentile. Come on, is anybody thankful that God gave you an opportunity to walk with him? I love this short little paragraph because we read over and over again the words, I will. Don't you love God's promises? God's promises can be something that we anchor our lives to. And in this section of scripture, Isaiah is promising the outpouring of God's spirit through the new covenant. These verses promise the spirit through the success of the gospel, which is Christ's death and resurrection to blot out our sin. This promise is made to Israel as long as it serves God and is upright. And the promise also reaches the Gentiles who will say, I am the Lord's and submit themselves to the God of Israel which is Jesus Christ. This is good news, church. We need his spirit. I don't know about you, but who in here wants power to fulfill the God-given purpose on their life? Who in here wants freedom over the sin that so easily ensnares them? Come on, who wants to experience peace and joy in the midst of trials and tribulation? Who in here wants to experience supernatural comfort in the midst of an uncomfortable season? Who wants to be released from bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness? If you said yes to any of those things, what you're telling me is you wanna be activated in the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, we are talking about the Holy Spirit, who is God, by the way. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit is God. Some of you heard Holy Spirit and your walls went right up. Rightfully so. The reality is, is in church culture, the Holy Spirit has been abused. We've called the works of the Spirit when it's really just the flesh manifesting itself. But here's the reality. We've gotta be able to embrace the mess, Christians, and give people grace to work this stuff out. We can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We need God's spirit for this hour. Revival is here, and we need the spirit of God to keep us hot, to keep the fire burning on the inside, because we've got a mission. We've got a people to reach. Come on, there are neighbors in your neighborhood that are lost. There are coworkers at your workplace that need Jesus. Your family is crying out for a new way, and we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Come on, is anybody with me today? We believe that the Holy Spirit is alive for today and that the spiritual gifts are activated right here and now so that heaven's mission can be accomplished in the earth. Come on, is anybody thankful for that today? And I think that as we look at this this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 44, and as we look at this idea of the Holy Spirit, let's just go to the New Testament And check out what Jesus has to say. Can we do that? I mean, shouldn't we look to him for instruction on the Holy Spirit? I love what it says in John 14, 17. It says that he is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him, here it is, because he lives with you, circle that word with, He lives with you now and later 
will be in you. This, the Greek word for with is a word called para, which means alongside. So I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit works in three different ways. This, this word para, alongside, this is when he's drawing you. This is when he's knocking on the door of your heart. As a matter of fact, there are some of you in here today, you're going, I don't know why in the world I am in this place today, but get me out of here quick. I wanna go to brunch. Can I tell you, God is drawing you. You think it was your friend that brought you here. God's got an assignment on your life. The Holy Spirit is working. And uh, I just wanna sh- I want us to understand this because what it's gonna do, I believe as, you, as we teach through the Holy Spirit today, there's a gratitude that's gonna come in your own heart. You've been giving people credit when really it was the Holy Spirit. 2006, I was uh, at Iowa State University playing football. I wanted to be a Hawkeye. I ended up at Iowa State for a lot of different reasons. And I was, wa- I was completely lost. I was walking through the darkest season of my life. I was depressed. I was confused. I was angry. I didn't even know why I was there. And if you would have looked at me on the outside, you would have said, you're a Division I football player. Of course you got it together. No, I didn't. I was standing at practice one day, and David Ray, a senior on my team, tapped on my shoulder and said, yo, you want to come to a Bible study with me? So I show up to this Bible study in 2006, and that entire year, this, the Holy Spirit was what? Drawing me, searching me out, drawing me in. And this is what's happening in some of your lives. But then there's, but then there's a shift, and we see it in John chapter 20. Now, this is after Jesus went to the cross and resurrected. He's now in his glorified state. His disciples are confused. They are perplexed. They're wondering, we put all of our hope and trust in this God that is dead now. A picture that. And then we read this and starting in verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Wait, hold up. Put yourself in their shoes. Can you imagine this? He says, peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Here it is, 22. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is where we get the Greek word en, E-N. Write this down. You gotta get this today. And this this Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Spirit in, in you. This is the Spirit for salvation. So this was the moment that his disciples were sealed for salvation. Now, some of you are like, wait, hold up. Weren't they saved when they said yes to following Jesus? No, they weren't because they couldn't be saved until Jesus conquered hell and death and came back in his glorified state. So, as we look at the scriptures, we see this, that the, that the Holy Spirit, para, is drawing people alongside, knocking. Right here, he's indwelling people by the power of the Spirit. It's the gift that he promises us. Those of you that repent of your sin, trust in his free gift from on that cross, and begin walking in the newness of life, you come forward here on a Sunday. The Holy Spirit is filling you, right here. E-N, indwelling Spirit of God. Now, as we read this, we would think to ourselves, now they're ready. God's going to release them to fulfill the mission, the Great Commission. But hold up, there's more. Check it out what in Acts 1, 4, and 5, it says this. Once when he was eating with them, so this is Jesus still in his glorified state, he commanded them, here's what he said, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power, Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Are you still with me? I'm doing some teaching this morning. We got to get this. This word for upon is epi in the Greek which means power, and the word for power in the Greek is dunamis, where we get the English word dynamite. This is where we get explosive power. 
Now, the reason why I want us to understand this today is because earlier I talked about those things that we want. Like you desire to have power to fulfill God's purpose on your life. You desire freedom from that sin that just keeps tripping you up. You're not experiencing peace and joy in the midst of trials and tribulations in your life. You want supernatural comfort that you're not experiencing. I find it interesting that Jesus, the one that we worship, the one that we model, has a separate moment from the indwelling Holy Spirit on his disciples and then instructing them to wait for the Spirit to come upon them. Could it be that we've got a lot of Christians that the Spirit is indwelling them, but they haven't received the power of the Spirit coming upon them so that they can fulfill what God has for their life? What if that's the gap from you and I walking in power? This was my story. I told you God started drawing me in, 20, in 2006. In 2007, in a Hollywood video parking lot, a teammate of mine shared the gospel with me. I felt God doing something in my heart that night, and I received his grace. And I can just tell you, for four straight years, I was walking through the sanctification process, and I was, I was, I was making progress forward and then taking two steps back and progress forward. And I saw transformation, but I didn't experience breakthrough. I'll never forget, fast forward, 2012. You guys know my story. I was out in Los Angeles, California. I call this my wilderness season. And if you came in today desperate, feeling like you're in the wilderness, dry, I just feel like I want to prophetically speak over your life that God is bringing rivers into the wilderness today, that he is going to refresh you and renew and pour out his spirit. And I'm just believing breakthrough in your life today. I remember being at a Thursday night midweek service. The pastor was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This, this idea of baptism, when we read that word in scripture, it's really just an immersion for a religious purpose. This idea, this is where I got the title, drenched. Like we need to be immersed in his spirit. If Cap walks in drenched, I can see it. I might even rub up against him and feel it. There's something contagious. When somebody's walking in the power of the spirit, you can't be around them too long to go, wait a second now, there's something different about this guy. But there's too many of us that are professing Jesus here, and then we go into our workplace, and we are stumbling and falling into the trap of being fearful of man. I think this is one of the ways that, that's, that's manifesting right now, that we're not walking in power, is we are afraid of man. And because we're fearful of man, it's prohibiting God's mission from moving forward. We need to be released of this. And on, on that Thursday night, at the end of the service, after teaching through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the laying on of hands to be empowered for that spirit to come upon, I will never forget it. I came to the altar. These elders started praying for me. And if you read about it in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit does come into the upper room, the Bible says that they started uttering in new languages. They started speaking in tongues. And this was my experience. I started uh, speaking in my new prayer language. This was what my experience was, and by no means am I trying to put my experience on you today, but here's what I know. We need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first purpose of power in fulfilling the mission that he has. Now, there's a lot of other things that come with it, anointing and a new spiritual gift. It could be tongues. It could be peace for a situation that you're walking through. We can't put God in a box. Come on, who wants to take God out of their little box today? We got to take God out of the box. And I think that we look no further than Peter's life to gain inspiration for what we're talking about here. Because there are some of you, man, you've been walking this thing out like I was for four years, and you're just in, in your heart of hearts. You know that there's more. The Holy Spirit is stirring your heart for the more. You're desiring the breakthrough. You're desiring the more. You want to go to a new level. You want to break through the ceiling. Come on, am I speaking to anybody today? You just know it. You feel it in your bones. Well, it's here today. 
You have access to this thing. And Peter is a perfect example. Peter, we know Peter that, that when Christ was going to the cross to be crucified, Peter did what? Talk to me, church. Come on, what did he do? He denied Christ, what, three times, right? So here's Peter denying Jesus three times. Then this moment happens in John chapter 20 where the indwelling Holy Spirit comes inside of them. Now here's what's interesting. Most of us wanna stop there. But how many of you know when you read John chapter 21, what did Peter return to doing? Fishing. He went back to what he was doing in his previous life, and I think it's a beautiful picture here of what I think is gonna happen in people's lives today. Peter, in, in the spirit and dwelling in him, tries to go fishing and catches nothing. Jesus comes out and he's like, yo, you might wanna try throwing your nets on the other side. Now, do you realize how offensive this would have been to a fisherman back in that day? Most fishermen would turn to the guy on the shore and say, say what? Eat dirt. <laughs> like, think about how ridiculous it is. Like, they're fishing on one side of the boat. Oh, there's gonna be all these more fish on right on the other side of the boat. But for some reason, Peter listened. I don't know why. As stubborn as that guy was, it just had to have been a God thing. He must have just, he, maybe he, he could just tell it was Jesus. So he throws his nets on the other side, and what happens? He catches so many fish. And I think this is such a good picture because here's what it is. It's like God is giving Peter a picture like, I'm calling you to be a be fisher of men. I'm calling you into something greater. Fast forward to the upper room where Jesus tells the disciples to wait. Can you imagine? They're all in a room. Imagine like, we're the disciples, early church. We're in this room and we're waiting for the spirit to come upon us to give us power to fulfill this mission. So they're patiently waiting and they're crying out and they're unified and they're believing and, and there's faith rising in the room. But Peter was still experiencing trembling that the soldiers would come and get them. So here's Peter the indwelling Holy Spirit is empowering him and he's operating in his old life and he's still experiencing some trembling. But in Acts chapter two, come on somebody, that spirit comes upon him and I don't know about you, but I read my Bible and it says that that same Peter that was trembling stood before the people on Pentecost and preached the gospel boldly and with courage and thousands of people were saved. So we gotta ask the question, what happened? He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was what the difference was. He needed something greater than his own strength. And here's the thing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's evidence, there's fruit, there's something that this thing produces. And I'm not even gonna get to it all today. I haven't even gotten to point number one. Oh, oh, geez, I'm gonna have to find a new way this week to get this content out. Can I do that? Can I, can I have some grace? Okay, Lord Jesus, what do you wanna speak to these people? I, I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna just give like a, an overview of, of what we see because it's interesting. If you dig a little deeper into Isaiah chapter 44, there's, there's like four promises here that the Bible gives us in regards to what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. We see it here starting in verse two. It says, do not be afraid. When the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, number one, it removes fear. It doesn't mean that fear doesn't confront you it just means when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't submit to fear any longer. You don't settle in fear. You don't let fear rule you. You rule over fear because of the Holy Spirit power in you. I love it. This week I had a perfect picture of this. All of our neighbors are trying to like, 
you know, learn how to ride their bikes, and so we're out there practicing, and, and we have some neighbor friends that are out there with their kid, and, our, and we're just doing this thing. And it's so fun working with kids trying to learn how to ride a bike. But man, I can tell you, as I was helping one of my kids this week learn, there's some fear to that thing, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of scary trying to ride that thing. We got a text from one of our neighbors that Judah looked at one of his friends and said, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I wanna tell us today, who wrote the word of God? The Holy Spirit wrote the word of God. So if you need access to the Spirit's power, look no further than the word of God. And if you're struggling or coming up against fear, you need to look that fear in the eye and say, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When you and I are baptized in the Spirit, when the Spirit has poured out over us, when we're drenched in the Spirit, it removes fear. And number two, it satisfies the thirst in our soul. So many of us are experiencing dissatisfaction that's been birthed through discontentment that is connected to an unrealistic expectation to be somewhere else rather than right where God has you. Come on, am I preaching today? You came in here thirsty for a relationship, thirsty for more money, thirsty for a new job, thirsty for more recognition. I've been thirsty for these things in my life only to get them and find myself thirsty again. But I'm declaring today that your soul can be satisfied by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ today. His well never runs dry. Come on, is anybody with me? If you remain in him, he will remain in you and you will produce much fruit. I wanna tell somebody today where you're looking for all these different things to satisfy your soul, you gotta get your eyes out of the window and get them in the mirror so that the Holy Spirit can speak to you. Stop living a life of comparison. Get it in the Word so that the Word can read you and set you free. Come on. The Holy Spirit removes fear. It satisfies the thirst in our soul. Number three, it causes us to thrive instead of survive. And number four, it causes us to live like springs, not sponges. Springs, not sponges. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet as I read Isaiah 58 to you, 11. It says this, that the Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. I wanna finish with this illustration that I heard from Rich Wilkerson Jr. I think it's, it's brilliant and it's powerful. And I know that there are some of you in this room today that your heart is being stirred and what you're saying is, yo, can somebody pray for me to receive the Holy Spirit? Like, I want that. I need the breakthrough, I need more power. I want that, and in a second, we're gonna give you an opportunity. If you have professed, professed Christ as your savior, but you want the more, we're gonna offer that for you today. We're gonna walk out what the Bible says. But I think what Jesus is, in, is inviting you and I into is to operate like a pizza box. You're like a pizza box, come on. We had pizza last night, come on, we're the people that rocked it with us. Wasn't it amazing? Come on, who likes a good pizza? Nobody receives a pizza and is like, this is an amazing box. No, they open that thing up and they're like, ooh, that pizza looks good. But a pizza box serves a purpose just like you and I do. Come on, if that pizza company brings a pizza box that is dirty and full of trash, you're gonna be like, take your pizza back. I just believe this and I wanna speak this in this room today that all God is looking for as you and I operate as a pizza box, he is the real thing, he is the gift, he's the thing that fills it, he's who we give away. All he's asking from us is to be clean and empty. Clean and empty. Is anybody with me today? Who wants more of God? Who wants more of the Holy Spirit? 
I think in the church we've been treating the Holy Spirit like, like a luxury rather than a necessity. We need the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mission in the earth, and the time is now. No more arms crossed, just kind of coasting through life. Jesus is inviting us into the more this morning. Do you believe it? And so we're gonna have an opportunity for response in this house. And I believe that there's two groups that I'm speaking to this morning. The first group I wanna address in here is those of you that you've never received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for salvation. The Bible's really clear. You and I, we've gone down our own path. We've gone our separate way in thought, word, and deed. And the Bible calls this sin. And I wanna tell somebody in here today, there's only one place that pathway takes us to, and it's a place called hell. It's real, and it's eternal separation from this holy God. But God loved you and I so much, and he said, I don't want my people to go down that path, so I'm gonna make a new path. But the only way they can go down the new path is through my son Jesus, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through who? Through Jesus. Not through your good works, not through reading the Bible, not through being a good person, not through going to church, through Jesus. It's a free gift, and all you have to do today is acknowledge your sin, repent and turn from it, and receive the free gift. Come on, he's inviting some of you to receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, to fill you afresh and anew. But there's a second group in here today. You're like Peter, received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but you need power. You're still experiencing trembling. You're still experiencing stumbling, and you want freedom, and you want breakthrough in this place, and you know that you haven't stepped up and had elders and pastors and leaders lay hands on you and pray for that. So as the band plays, I don't know which group you're in, but I wanna invite you forward and we're gonna pray with you today and God's spirit is gonna break out and we're gonna leave here changed and different. Do you believe it? So band, go ahead and play. If I'm speaking to you, come on, make your way forward this morning. Don't wait another day.